Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. If you look at higher education, higher education has been such a fundamental element in, our, uh, in the U.S. Uh, it has really been the, the cornerstone of our democracy. It has really played a major role in our economic vibrancy and creating uh, uh, thriving and healthy communities for us. If you, the three elements that had really had major impact on our higher education was first, uh, the Morrell Act 151 years ago, uh, second will be the GI Bill, and the third was the post-Sputnik uh, era. And now if we look at where we are today, the higher education model that we have still uses the agrarian calendar of, of the 18th century. We have the model of delivery, which is the 19th century industrial model using part of the 20th uh, century curriculum. So what, you know, but if you look at many of the changes that, uh, that is really happening in the world, you know, uh, in the, with all of the technologies that we have, we have a very hyper-connected world. In this hyper-connected world, people can uh, get together and we see organ uh, systems come together and organize itself very quickly. We have such an acceleration of so many innovation and so many key things that are happening. And also as part of it, we see that two elements that has such a transformative effect on our, our organizations. One is the uh, uh, IT area, and the second is organizational culture. And these are the two elements that, uh, that can really make organizations move in a very major way. Let's look at some major changes that we have in the world. We have over you know, uh, six and a half billion uh, mobile devices. Truly, we can say that there are more cell phones in the world than tooth, you know, used than more toothbrushes. If you just look at the when electricity started, we, it started around 19, you know, 1900. And uh, over a century, we still, uh, globally, we have about 76% of the world population having access to electricity, while just uh, in less than a decade, more than 81% of the world population have the access to some kind of a mobile device. And also, we are seeing you know, new and innovative ways of how people can really use uh, technology in, new in more imaginative ways that they can use that one. And also, when we look at uh, the devices, yeah, you just look at the internet and its life, we see more than, more than 10 billion uh, devices, uh, uh, really, that are connected. Also, we, you know, we see an environment that we have to trailblaze in terms of what's happening and how we can learn from others as well as uh, benchmark, uh, trailblaze ourselves as well as benchmark from others. And as part of that, when we have to develop this ambidexterity that not only learn from others, but what we can uh, uh, do ourselves. And for this one, higher education has really changed the DNA, its, all, its DNA and its genetic code of becoming more, more transformative than what it has uh, been in the past. So it means that we have to move just from how we solve problems on how we can really imagine new possibilities. And I think within the new possibilities, you know, look at how technologies have really changed that we're moving from individual specific technologies to, uh, to major platforms. And these platforms are really have been the new, the new way that technology proliferate in such a major area. And those, when you know, if you look at you know, uh, Amazon, how Amazon has really changed the whole supply chain system globally. When we look at uh, uh, social media and uh, uh, people platform, basically it, the changes that Facebook brought, the tablet by Apple and all of the different uh, mobile devices that all of us see, uh, the information platform developed by Google, and also the mobile itself. So if you just look at the mobile devices, look at all of the different switches that we have in all parts of our lives, from how to start our car to our door keys to everything else. Why do we really need any of those switches? Because if you have our mobile devices, that should be able to do all of that for us. So that's the kind of environment that we really are uh, really seeing ourselves. So again, as I said, you know, when we look at so many people being part of, the, uh, part of uh, these systems, as well as um, uh, as well as looking, for instance, as the Internet of Everything, as we said, we have over 10 billion devices connected. But in reality, we have less than 1% of the devices connected. So potentially, we can see more than a billion, uh, I'm sorry, a trillion devices connected, which, and the potential of that could be over at $14.4 trillion economically. And as part of that, on what we see uh, for higher education, we, we're beginning to see the you know, the, uh, the development of uh, massive open online that I think uh, you know, the, everyone has seen what has happened in the, last, uh, in the last year or so. So one of the approaches was, you know, as we are in our, uh, we find ourselves in this kind of a crossroad, we see some of the new technologies and see uh, new uh, advents and new opportunities as well as threats that we have. First of all, in terms of cybersecurity, cybersecurity for a long time, we looked at it as something that affects only the techies, 
but now even if a uh, six-year-old has some kind of a device connected to the internet. So what's the level of cyber hygiene that even a, a, a six-year-old uh, or 10-year-old kid need, uh, needs to know? When you look at big data, big data viewed as the, as the uh, you know, data is the new oil of, uh, of the 21st century, and uh, the analytics that really comes as part of it, and also as part of it, a massive open online or digital education, how all of these ones come together. And part of one of the way that we have tried to envision that one is how we can really look at an open, uh, uh, an, uh, open uh, uh, learning ecosystem. And then this, this kind of an open learning ecosystem, we can look at a whole education system from uh, pre-K all the way through college and beyond. Because usually we talk about uh, cradle to career. In reality, we have to look at cradle through careers because even once the, today's uh, students the uh, college graduates will go through 10 job changes by the time they are 41. So we, how we can, the universities can really be part of their lives throughout, the, you know, throughout their career and also beyond uh, after, after they retire. So, you know, just going to a few of these elements in terms of cybersecurity, specifically, as I mentioned, uh, one of those uh, hidden courses of technology that you know, when we have so many devices a part of it, it's impacting every part of our lives, and, it's, and especially when we see more and more devices that are connected, how it has become almost a, a survival skill that every professional is expected to have. Uh, on big data, as I mentioned that, you know, b being the new oil, and most of the jobs that we see, most of the competencies that is gonna be required practically from everyone is gonna be in the area of uh, big data. And especially for higher education, because if you look at higher education, as someone said, higher education traditionally has been more like where healthcare was before the advent of the micro, of microscope. So it was the microscope that really changed uh, healthcare system as a whole. Without having analytics, in a way, higher education ha uh, or education system has been uh, in the same place because we have not had that level of data that would really give us the, the kind of insights that we really need to really. Uh, uh, evaluate what really works, what does not work, and what works to what extent that works, and how can we segregate that one for different groups and different individuals and really make uh, education very, uh, very individualized. Predictive analytics, as I said, the whole idea of data sciences, how it's becoming an important in all different fields, and how data becomes DNA of understanding the DNA of practically every field. And if I just look at it within uh, higher education or within every organization, uh, about a uh, decade and a half ago, we began seeing the roles of CIOs. We began to see C uh, T CTOs or the chief te uh, technology officers. And now I think we're gonna see, see uh, chief data officers in organization and maybe CXOs or so many other ones that will come later on. And I think this, this level of predictiveness uh, of technology that is gonna be so critical and as part of that one, I think it's gonna have major impacts on online education as a whole. The internet of everything, again, as I mentioned earlier, more than 10 billion devices connected uh, right now, but it's less than 1% of the devices connected and potentially the impact of, financial impact of uh, more than 14.4 uh, uh, trillion dollars. So the MOOC hysteria is something that, of course, the media made it as the uh, 2012 as the as the year of uh, MOOCs and all of the great, uh, major uh, predictions that they had. But one of the things that we all have to remember that whenever there is a new technology, we try to overemphasize it's, uh, what it can deliver in the short run and underemphasize what it can impact in the long term. So the impact of MOOC is not gonna be a short term, it is gonna be a long term issue. Key uh, con uh, organizations that has been part of the uh, MOOC has been Coursera, edX, and uh, Udacity. Uh, what San Jose State tried to do is we said, well, how about if we can try to bring many of these elements together and how we can create a model? Well, if you look at the basic two years of college education can be uh, reduced to about uh, 25 to 30 courses. And the idea was that if we can put these courses on an open, uh, on a, an open cloud where students, when they are in high school, can access it, uh, uh, also um, uh, students who are in the... Uh, community colleges and universities, so students could do those one to two years of their college while they're still actually in high school or do it in their own pace as quickly as they can. When they come to the campus, then the other two years could be done with a combination of MOOCs, uh, face-to-face, -face, 
and so many other uh, flipped classrooms and uh, as well as combining uh, uh, other elements such as uh, 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 other types of learning such as uh, 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 undergraduate research, uh, such as uh, internships, such as service learning, and that combination is really going to give us a holistic education level. A few examples of what we did, as I said, this is some of the results that we had from our uh, MIT edX course that, uh, that we were able to do. Uh, we were the first university. This is our electric circuit course. Traditionally, we have uh, uh, the pass rate on this course was about 59%, so 41% of the students were getting a grade of C or below and they had to repeat it. By using the MIT material, students uh, uh, before coming to the class and the class becoming an application, were able to change that pass rate to 91%, so only 9% uh, of the students had to shift. And we have done it for three semesters and we are getting other benefits from it as well as prototyping that students learn as well as a lot of design thinking as part of it. Uh, so we have created a center of excellence uh, with MIT edX so uh, faculty members could get trained at San Jose State for the West Coast without going to uh, edX all the way into the cold weather of uh, uh, Cambridge right now. Uh, our other experience was with Udacity where we started offering some uh, last spring uh, courses, uh, uh, lower division courses uh, at a cost of $150 for three credits. Uh, with, uh, uh, with mentors available on a 24-7 basis for students. Uh, the first sem uh, semester, the, uh, the grades were not very good, but by the, se by the summertime, out of the five courses that we offered, the three of the, and for three of the courses, the, the passing rate was better than face-to-face. -face. Uh, now, and that's part of it, the San Jose State got uh, the Innovator Award of the 2013. And I think, you know, this, I just wanted to bring this technology. This is the Google technology. This is the kind of environment that our students are going to have in the next six months or less. Some people, you know, many of us in the Bay Area see the Google Glass already. So how can we really get ourselves to the kind of environment that students will have in the kind of world that they really need to be part of it? I mean, another example that I want to bring was this, uh, uh, when you look at the, the, uh, all of these uh, collaborative models where, you know, when you look at uh, this, uh, these, uh, uh, these particular symbols as everyone you are not, not only we are uh, we are uh, creating we are also consuming but also creating knowledge and and if you uh, any of you go and look at the Duolingo uh, uh, program you can see that uh, you can get a sense that you know that's what higher education is going to become that everyone is going to be a producer as well as uh, uh, as generator and so the new environment that we really have to look at higher education is how we can move from disengaged uh, students to really an extremely uh, extreme uh, learners where uh, rather than having homework, students would really be aspired to look at the content and look at rather than seeing lectures, we can really see collaboratoria and really trying to move from grades to continuous feedback that are offered for our students. So the new technology that we see, the changes is almost like when we move from Roman numbers to Indian numbers. I mean, that's really the kind of change that we have. It's a, it's a, it's a far bigger one. And the speed that we have to change and the opportunities that we have are tremendous. We have to make sure we keep that in mind. So as part of this kind of an environment, I think we are really ready that we can really create an environment of using all of these technologies that could really reach to the largest number of students, especially when we look at students in the underserved communities, especially when we look at students in the uh, in the uh, uh, urban areas because in the current environment that we have, those students who are in the top economic quartile, by the time they are 25, we have 80 they have an 80% chance of having a college degree. But those who are in the bottom economic quartile, they have an 8%. So our zip code is really becoming the future for getting college attainment. I think these approaches could really change that one and really give the kind of environment that we really would like to see. Okay, and thank you very much. And this is, I have the website for some of the, the couple of papers that we have in that, and you can look into that. Okay. Well, thank you very much.